Today I'm going to show you my method of making your own cables, something like this. Now if you've ever priced out cabling for inverters or battery applications or even automotive type applications, you know that they're fairly expensive, availability isn't all that great, it's often difficult to get the correct ends that you want on each end of the cable and to get the correct length, color, and, uh, and cable type, gauge, etc. A lot of times the only practical solution is to make your own cables. And I have a video, uh, I'll put a link somewhere on this video, about how to select the right wire gauge for your application. I'd highly recommend checking out that video. There's not very many videos out there uh, that accurately describe how to select the proper cable. Uh, but I left out how to put the right terminations on the end. Now, there are so many different types of terminations and such out there that it's not all that practical to uh, add that to that cable video, so I'm making my own video here. And for this, I'm simply going to put ring terminals on some cables that I have to make. To make your own cables, you obviously need two things. You need cable and terminations. In this case, I have some two gauge cabling. This is true two gauge. I measured to make sure that it was true two gauge. Oftentimes, it is not. And that's important because if it's not, it won't properly fit the terminations that you choose. In this case, I'm using these ring terminals, heavy duty pure copper ring terminals. So let's go out to the garage and I'll show you my process for making cables. On the bench, I have the basic tools that I'm going to use for this task. First, of course, I have my cables and terminations. I have a, uh, something to remove the insulation. You can use a wire stripper, I find that. Standard utility knife works just fine. Something to cut the cables, of course. Uh, you could also use a utility knife for that. Solder of some sort. This is electronic solder. I would recommend something that is thicker. It contains more flux, but regular solder, some flux, your propane torch. Uh, I'm going to use a punch and a hammer. That's somewhat optional. And I'm going to use my bench vise with anvil to do the rest of the work. The first thing to do is to cut your cable to length. And the proper length for mine is about right here. I'm just eyeballing it. So now that we have our cable, it's time to strip some insulation off of each end. This is the end that I just cut. It's nice, bright, shiny copper, as it should be. This is the end that was exposed when I purchased this roll. And you may notice that there is some oxidation on it. I would always recommend to cut off the uh, half inch or so of the exposed end of the copper wire before you put your terminations on. Otherwise, when you try to meet, mate these two together, they won't necessarily make a low conduct or a high conductivity connection. And it'll be difficult to solder also because there's corrosion in there. Now there's many different tools out there for stripping insulation off of cabling. I prefer to just use a utility knife. It works just fine if you're careful. I don't make cables every day, so I don't want to go out and buy a new tool for it. I have one that works. I'm just going to use this. In terms of how much insulation to strip off, you'll take your connection, whatever it might be. This happens to be this copper ring terminal. Put it on here and see how far up you need to strip it. In this case, I need to go at least up to here, and I should go a little bit further also, because you need to have some copper exposed behind the end of this ferrule, or otherwise you won't be able to put solder inside. Now that the insulation has been removed, and I actually removed a little bit too much, but that's all right. Next thing to do is to grab your flux. This just happens to be some standard rosin flux that I have. Take your flux and dip your cable into it. You don't need a lot, just a little bit to help the solder flow. And that's good. Flux is actually acidic, and you need to burn off all of the flux, otherwise the uh, copper will corrode over time. That's extremely important. So if you use too much flux, you can actually get a joint that oxidizes over time. So you don't want to use too much flux on this. Something like this is enough. And now you can take your terminal and just slip that over the end. And you can see that I have a little bit excess copper exposed there. I stripped just a little bit too much off, but Again, that's not all that important. Next, I'm going to crimp the terminal onto the cable. Now, they do make crimpers just for this application. You hit them with a hammer, uh, set them on an anvil, hit it with a hammer, and it crimps the, uh, the cable. Um, 
I don't have one of those and the whole point of this is to save money so I'm not going to buy one just to make a couple of cables and you really don't need one anyway. There's alternatives. For example, I have this bench vise and it's pretty good at squeezing things so I'm just going to put that in here and crimp it up this way. You could also use vice grips that will give you a little bit cleaner crimp than what this does. I usually use those but I'm going to try my uh, bench vise this time. I see no reason why it wouldn't work. There we go, it's crimped on. And I'm not sure if I could pull this off if I tried. It's, it's on there pretty tight. But I don't really trust this connection at this point, just having it crimped like this. I do want it soldered. So now I'm going to put the cable in my vise, just something to hold it here. And solder it up. Now when you heat it with the torch, you want to make sure that you only heat the end of the ring. If you heat the uh, copper up here, you'll actually see the copper oxidize. You don't want the copper to oxidize, and as this warms up, you may notice a partially green flame coming off of it. The green flame is oxidized copper. Now if you oxidize the outside of this terminal ring, that doesn't really affect anything, but you don't want to oxidize anything inside. So that's why I'm only going to heat the end and not the cable itself. And once it's hot enough, the solder should flow into this joint. I should be using a thicker, thicker solder here than this little thin stuff, but this is what I have, so this is what I'm going to use. wouldn't normally take this long if you had the appropriate solder, but I do not, so it takes a long time to feed enough in here. It looks like we're getting close. And it looks like it's pretty well filled up. It's going to start dripping out the bottom if I keep going, so... I'll let that cool. And that is how I would recommend making cables. It makes a nice solid connection both mechanically and electrically. Uh, this particular one looks pretty ugly. I didn't do the cleanest job on it, but it is a good connection and that's how I'd recommend making them. However, I am not going to make them that way on my battery bank because I have at least 10 cables to make. This is kind of a pain and I am lazy. So I'm going to do it this way. And this is very, very quick. And it makes a pretty good connection. It is basically the same thing, but not soldered. So I'm going to quick show you how to make a cable like this. Again, I wouldn't recommend it, but it's good enough for what I'm doing, and it may be good enough for you as well. First thing to do is measure your cable. I know that I need about 10 inches, so I will measure out 10 inches. And cut it. Easy enough. Next, I need to strip the insulation off. I'll do it just like before with a standard utility knife. You don't need any special wire strippers. Just make sure that you uh, don't go too deeply into the insulation, otherwise you will end up cutting off strands of wires. And the insulation will just separate, just like that. And you have a nice clean stripped wire. That was also easy. 
Next, we'll go over to my bench vise and take your ring terminal and put it into the vise from the bottom side up so that just the ring is sticking out the top. I'm going to center it in the vise just so I can get a, a good, even, good even pressure on it. Start it just so it doesn't slip out. Take your wire, put it in here, and squeeze it down. And there you go. You have a connection that is pretty solid. But I have one more step that I like to do just to make sure that it's on there very well. I'm going to use the anvil that's on the back of my vise, a punch, and a very big hammer. And there you go. You have a connection that is not going to come loose. You can bend it around sharp angles, it doesn't pull out, and it's fairly low resistance. This isn't as good as a soldered connection, but it took me all of about 45 seconds to do this. I can make a cable in a minute and a half, and uh, that's how I'm going to make mine, because it's very quick. And after just 10 minutes or so, I have this many cables made. This one isn't quite done yet, but it's a pretty quick procedure to make these cables, and uh, those are two ways that you can make battery cables. Thanks for watching. A couple of last thoughts before I go here. These connections that have no solder in them have no protection against corrosion. They will corrode eventually, especially if you use them on a battery where you get gases, corrosive gases coming out of the batteries. These will corrode internally eventually and you'll get a higher resistance connection that may overheat and be a hazard. So depending on the application, this may or may not be the best idea. If you add solder to it like I did here, the solder will prevent it from corroding. So this will last almost indefinitely. You'll just have to clean corrosion from the outside for the connection's sake to the battery post, and you'll be fine. So that may be one reason why you want to put solder in it. The other thing that I did not mention was a lot of cables come with heat shrink. And in general, people will recommend you put heat shrink on. But I do not like heat shrink whatsoever because, tell me, by looking at this, how do you know if the connection is in good condition? How do you know if it's corroding? How do you know if it's slipping out of the crimp? It hides everything. It hides all of the information that you need to know to know if this cable is safe. The only reason to put heat shrink on is for cosmetic reasons. Also, you should not rely on heat shrink to insulate from contact. If you have another cable over here that's a negative cable and you rely on this heat shrink, it'll eventually rub through and it's likely to short out. Very dangerous. So, there really isn't any good reason to use heat shrink. I don't like this stuff for cables like this. It's good for cosmetic purposes if you're making cables for sale. It'll hide a lot of manufacturing defects, which is why you pretty much always see heat shrink on cables that you purchase. Because if they're crimped poorly, you just don't know. They overheat and, well, that's that. So I just wanted to uh, leave with those two parting thoughts. But uh, in any case, this is just a little addendum. But uh, again, thank you for watching.